You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking with you this time about a glad obedience. Operation Alka was nearing the countdown by Christmas of 1955. Operation Alka was an attempt on the part of five American missionary men in Ecuador, South America, to make an entrance into a tribe from which no one had ever come back out. The Aucas, A-U-C-A, a people known to be savages. They killed strangers. They were Stone Age people. They wore no clothes. But God loved them, and we knew that the gospel needed to be taken to them someday. Somebody had to do it, and Jim and Nate and Pete and Ed and Raj had volunteered to do that job. On New Year's Day of 1956, Ed McCulley and his wife Mary Lou and their two little boys and the Flemings, Pete and Olive, were with us on our station in Shandia. Jim was expecting to leave on January the 3rd for Operation Alka, and after the McCulleys and the Flemings had left, I thought, well, we'll have a couple of days, just the two of us, plus our little baby, who was only 10 months old then. We'll have a chance to talk more, to pray, to prepare ourselves for what we thought might be as much as two or three weeks apart. And, of course, in the back of the minds of each of us was the possibility that this would be our last couple of days together. I was thinking the usual things that a wife would think under those circumstances. What can we do that would be special to celebrate these couple of days together? I wished with all my heart that I were going along. The original plan had been for me to go with Jim in a dugout canoe taking our baby down the rivers into Alka territory. The thought was that if a man came in with his wife and baby, even the most savage people would not imagine that he was coming with any hostile intentions. But then that plan, Plan A, was changed to Plan B, in which no women were participating, just five men were going to go. Anyway, January 3rd was departure date, we thought. And so I had all my plans laid for the things which we would do between New Year's Day and then. And suddenly, on New Year's Day, Nate called us on the radio to say, tomorrow is the day that I'm coming to pick up Jim, so get ready. Well, there had to be a lot of excitement and throwing things into Indian carrying nets. Jim got his harmonica, a snake bite kit, a flashlight, a viewmaster with slides, thinking that that might entertain the Indians, a yo-yo, his language notebook, whatever else he could think of that he might need or that might amuse them. And what if he doesn't come back, I was thinking. What am I going to do in this jungle station? I knew that I didn't need to trouble myself about thoughts like that. Jesus has said, take no thought for tomorrow. Tomorrow will take thought for the things of itself. There was a last packing and a last lunch, and then the plane came in. Jim was ready. He grabbed the Indian carrying net, opened the door, slammed it shut, swung down the path with his usual big, strong stride. I looked back at the door. I thought, does he realize he might never slam that door again? But I didn't say it. In Nate's diary, he wrote about what happened that night. He was in Atahuno, Ed and Mary Lou McCulley's station, the place which was the closest jumping-off point for Alka territory. I drowsed off quite soon, but was checking the luminous face of my watch dial at 12.30, again at 2, and from then on I was on horizontal listening post guard duty. I prayed, tried repeating verses from memory, and even counting. My entire share in this business seemed to hinge on that first takeoff and landing. Then, too, I had told the fellows that I would only take one in alone on the first trip. That meant a lonely vigil for someone. Raj was ruled out because he spoke only Hivero. 
Ed had already beat Jim by pulling straws, but Jim held out, claiming to be lighter. When I said a difference of 15 pounds would be decisive, they dragged out the bathroom scales. Ed was only seven pounds heavier than Jim. Why, you cotton picker, said Jim, you've lost weight. Nate's diary went on. If I should misjudge, Ed and I would really be in a fix. Well, he woke up that morning, had the radio contact at 7 o'clock, went out and checked the plane, and the five men met together for prayer. They sang a favorite hymn, We Rest on Thee, to the tune of Finlandia. Jim and Ed had sung this hymn since college days and knew the verses by heart. On the last verse, their voices rang out with real conviction. We rest on thee, our shield, and our defender, thine is the battle. Thine shall be the praise when passing through the gates of pearly splendor. Victors, we rest with thee through endless days. Nate tells about his first landing with a passenger. I had planned three runs before landing, but the thing was exactly as we had seen it several times before. As we came in the second time, we slipped down between the trees in a steep slide. It felt good as we made the last turn and came to the sand, so I set it down. The right wheel hit within six feet of the water, and the left ten feet later. As the weight settled on the wheels, I felt it was soft sand. Too late to back out now, I hugged the stick back and waited. One softer spot and we'd have been on our nose, maybe our back. It never came. We jumped out, rejoicing in the deliverance. The relief at being past that hurdle without damage dampened my sensitivity to the glaring possibility that I might not be able to take off. It was great just to be there. They were very tricky landings, and Nate made three more with Jim and Raj and Pete. When Jim got in, then Nate flew in the pieces of the treehouse, which Jim had prefabricated at our station. The men set to work quickly, setting the treehouse up, nailing the boards. And the next morning, January the 4th, Jim wrote me a letter. Just worked up a sweat on the hand crank of the radio. Nobody is reading us, but we read all the morning contacts clearly. We had a good night with a coffee and sandwich break at 2 a.m., didn't set a watch last night as we really feel cozy and secure 35 feet off the ground in our little bunks. The beach is good for landings, but too soft for takeoffs. We have three alternatives. One, wait for the sun to harden it up and sit until a stiff breeze makes a takeoff possible. Two, go make a strip in Terminal City. Terminal City was the nickname the men had given to the Alka village. Number three, walk out. Our hopes are up, but no signs of the neighbors yet. Neighbors was their code name that they used on the radio for the Alcas. Perhaps today is the day the Alcas will be reached. It was a fight getting this hut up, but it sure is worth it to be up off the ground. We're going down now. Pistols, gifts, novelties, and prayer in our hearts. The next morning was Thursday, Nate saw some footprints from the plane, which looked as though they were headed in the direction of the missionaries' camp. A machete, which they had left as a gift on a distant beach, seemed to be gone. They went down by foot from their camp and found that the footprints were not new ones, and the machete was not gone, but only hidden by a leaf. They were disappointed, of course. They went back to their beach shelter, the flies, the gnats, and the heat. They spent part of the day shouting out the few Alka phrases that they had learned toward the jungle across the river, hoping that somebody was there, somebody might be listening and might appear. They had their notebooks. They made notes of everything that was going on. Jim went fishing, caught himself a 15-inch catfish, and made a stew in the pressure cooker. Then as Nate flew over the Alka village, he saw a man kneeling on a platform which they seemed to have built for the plane, pointing at the campsite as Nate flew over. They know where we are, Nate said. He was elated. And then he wrote in his diary, the engine skipped a beat over Terminal City 
spark plug trouble. A man was kneeling on the platform toward the direction of the campsite and pointing with both hands. This really gave us a boost. We hurried back and glided down over camp, shouting the news. They signaled OK, and we hit for home. At Atahuno, we circled a couple of times, shouting a welcome to anyone who might be in the bush, then landed. After landing, Pete and I walked the airstrip with a gift machete. No soap. We find we have a friendlier feeling for these fellows all the time. We must not let that lead us to carelessness. It is no small thing to try to bridge between 20th century and the Stone Age. God help us to take care. Everyone is in bed and asleep here now, so it is left to me to go down the path and shut off the diesel. My little blank revolver is a welcome companion on such a venture. But safety is of the Lord. May we see them soon. Good night. And so their obedience was a glad one. They were ordinary guys with an eternal perspective, doing what they thought God wanted them to do. A yo-yo and a harmonica, huh? Well, that was a glad obedience. Uh, Gateway to Joy, program 93.